Hi there, welcome to the video. Uh, my name is Byron Clark. I've spent most of the past decade helping job seekers get hired uh, through my blog, careersidekick.com, um, as an executive recruiter for multiple employers in the US, Europe, uh, including venture-funded tech startups, Fortune 500 companies, and everything in between. Uh, and so this is what I do, and I want to share three resume tweaks that will get you more interviews. These are the first places that I see mistakes and, and things that need correction when the average job seeker comes to me with their resume. Um, so these are the most high impact things that you can do, changes you can make that will get you real results. Because the reality is I could name 40 or 100 little tweaks that you should make, but it's, it's, it's smarter to start with the big ones that, that will have the highest impact and get you results right away. So that's what we're doing here. These are the big things. First thing, uh, first tweak, stop listing responsibilities on your resume. So if your bullet points, for example, if they start with phrases like responsible for blank, uh, it's costing you job interviews, plain and simple. Hiring managers or, or headhunters, recruiters, as they read your resume, they don't want to just see you list things you were responsible for. It's not impressive. You're essentially, if you do this, you're basically just showing what your past boss told you to do. You know, they assigned me this work. They told me I need to be doing five of this per day. It's not impressive. It doesn't show any initiative. It doesn't show the results or accomplishments you got and you know what you did with that assignment. How did you take that, that request from your boss and turn it into a success? It tells nothing about that. Um, so instead, we want to fill your resume with accomplishments and results and what you actually achieved, how you helped your past employers. Because really, when a recruiter or hiring manager looks at, at your recent work experience on your resume, uh, they're, they're looking for evidence or proof that, that you're likely to be able to come in and succeed in this next job as well. And that's the number one thing they're looking for, the first thing they're looking for, 99% uh, of the time. And so the best way to show this and demonstrate this is often by showing past successes and you know, how have you succeeded in your last job. That's the, the easiest way to prove you're going to succeed in this next job. So where can you put these accomplishments? Where are we talking about? Where do you want to remove responsible for and, and start putting real accomplishments? Well, your employment history bullet points are the first place I would do this because that's the first place that I look as a recruiter. Uh, your intro paragraph on your resume. And anywhere else you talk about past work and, and your professional background and what you've done in the past. So here is how to write it. Here's how to actually do it. Um, pretend we're, think of your own resume bullet points under your most recent job. Um, and the best way to do it is you start with a verb instead of starting with responsible for. Um, so, so the bad example here, you, you might have said responsible for training new customer service team members. Uh, you're a lot better off saying something like trained. So you see how you're starting with a verb, trained. Uh, so trained seven to 10 new customer service team members per quarter, leading them from new hires to fully independent customer service reps within three weeks. Uh, the next one, another good example, led the training of seven to two new customer service team members per quarter, bringing them from new hires to fully independent customer service reps within three weeks. So very similar, it's just a different verb. I like starting, uh, Led is a great verb. Anytime you led like a project or an initi initiative or a task, or in this case, leading the training of, of people, led is a really good verb to use. Um, but the middle example, trained, is also a good verb that you can use. You've also, if you notice, um, or I want you to notice, there are also metrics and, and statistics and data in these two good examples. And that's really important to do as well. We'll talk more about that in a second. But it's really great here to say, you know, how many people did you train? And then what was the time period? Okay, within three weeks, you're able to do all of this, this training. That makes it a lot more interesting. And in general, if, if you, whenever you're telling a story or talking about something in the past, being more specific makes it more believable and more tangible to the other person. It makes it more real to them. If I tell you, I went for a hike yesterday, you don't really have any picture of that. You're like, okay, who cares? But if I say, Oh, I, I hiked eight hours yesterday. I was sweating so much that my shirt turned into a darker color. Um, you know, the sun was beating down on my face and uh, I, you know, I didn't get home until 9 p.m. It was pitch black out. I, it was, just, you get the point. Sharing details makes a story, uh, puts an image in the other person's head, it gives context. So 
Obviously, you don't want to write your bullets like that. You're not telling a, a hiking story, but you do want to put some, uh, some detail there. All right, tweak number two, two out of three. Uh, pack your resume with data and metrics. So we sort of just talked about this, but uh, whenever you can, be more specific and put facts, data, metrics, and real results on your resume instead of just saying led people or trained new team members or things like that. Um, here, are, here are some examples of types of data you can put. So you can put dollar amounts, you can put percent increases and, de and decreases. Sometimes an increase is good, like increasing group productivity. Sometimes a decrease is good, like uh, decrease the average customer wait time by 20% by implementing a new queuing process, something like that. Uh, numbers of people, so people you led, people you trained, customers served per day, per week, phone calls taken. Uh, we'll get to that next actually, but so anything to deal with people, either people on your team or customers or clients. Okay, so next, volume of work done, um, number of phone calls taken, number of projects completed, if you're a writer, how many pieces of content do you write per week? Things like that. Uh, and then finally, much, much more, really just depending on your industry, there are so many possibilities. For example, you know, if you're a truck driver, you could say successfully delivered 29,000 tons of freight in quarter four, 2018. That's a really specific example that only is gonna work if you're delivering freight, but the point is, depending on your industry, there are so many more things you can come up with uh, if you think about it, you sit down with a piece of paper and just try to attach numbers to every bullet you've written already or every, every main task that you've done in your past work. You don't need to be in sales to do this. A lot of people ask me, actually this first bullet here, this is a real question from a reader. How do I quantify my work as a creative writer? So anyone can do this. Yes, a creative writer can absolutely do this. There are two good ways that anyone can do this. One. Uh, you can use individual personal achievements. So that's like the truck driver example I just gave, or, or a writer could say produced 12 high quality articles per month for blank. Notice produced is a verb, so we're still starting with a verb instead of responsible for, really, really important. But you can also rely on company and group metrics. If you didn't have a lot of individual metrics in your role, you can still say something like produced web articles read by 25,000 daily readers uh, for clients in the gaming and technology industries, or uh, led content creation for our $250 million a year software business, producing 12 articles per month, read by 25,000 daily website visitors. So now you're relying on the, you're leaning on the, the, the impressive statistics that your employer has built up and making your work seem significant. You're showing the significance of your work because you're supporting this $250 million a year business, even if your role is very small. You know, any individual in a, in a business that large, they're not doing everything, that's okay, but you're showing the significance of your work. So that's the other, uh, the other big thing you can do is rely on company metrics and you don't have to only have statistics for your specific work. Let's keep moving here. Uh, why will this get you more interviews? Why does this matter? Why should you bother following my advice? Uh, well, recruiters and hiring managers, skim your resume at first. You need to catch their attention right away. I don't know if you've heard the myth that uh, you have like eight to 10 seconds and that's how long a recruiter will read your resume. It's kind of true and kind of not true. It's how long we will skim for at first when deciding whether to read more. So I will look for around eight seconds. The first place I look is your most recent work, your bullet points, then usually I'll, I'll, my eyes will go back up to the, the intro paragraph or the career summary paragraph. And then maybe I'll look at your skills section if it's up top, but not as much. Really your most recent work and maybe your intro paragraph are where I look first. Um, and if I don't see the right things there for the job you've applied for, if it doesn't seem relevant and you haven't really proved to me that you're likely to be able to come in and succeed in this next job, then I'm moving on to the next resume. However, uh, in that first eight to 10 second period, if you do grab my attention, I'm reading plenty more. I'm reading for a couple more minutes. I'm emailing the hiring manager, telling them I'm excited and I found somebody they really should interview. So you need to grab attention in the first 10 seconds and then you'll have much more, uh, you'll have them reading much more after that. So uh, because your employment history is the first place I look as a recruiter, you know, those most recent bullets for your last one or two jobs, that's where you really want data and metrics to, to 
grab my attention. I mean, numbers and symbols, like a percent symbol, a dollar sign, those stand out visually. They will make your resume look very different from everybody else's or, or most everybody else's. And so it gets the reader to stop and say, oh, you know, what's this? $250 million, what are they? And then, you know, maybe I'll go back and read a little more slowly and stop skimming. And that's the goal. Um, your resume really only has one goal in general, which is get you invited to interview. But I, I think of that in two parts. And that first part is getting them to stop in the first 10 seconds, getting the reader to stop. And then once they've slowed down and they're really reading, then convincing them to invite you to interview and, and showing you're qualified and deserve an interview. But you got to stop them first and, and numbers and symbols and, and hard data and statistics are a great way to, uh, to do that. If you don't have the data for this, ask. Um, do research about former companies or your current company. See what's available publicly. If they're a publicly traded company, like if they have a stock symbol and they're a public company, you're going to have a ton of info available on the web because they have to release like financial data and things like that. Um, but you can still find this. If not, just do your research and then ask former bosses. If, if you don't know the amount of work you produced or if you're not sure, ask. Ask a coworker. Yes, it's a bit challenging and, and most people don't want to do it, but you have to do a few things differently if you want to stand out in your job search. And it's good that nobody else is doing this because it's how you'll stand out. And listen, if 100% if of people were out there doing this, it wouldn't benefit your resume because everybody's resume would look like this. But I can tell you from looking at thousands of resumes as, as a recruiter, very few people have this on there and it's going to make you stand out. Um, and so do whatever it takes to get the data. Ask people, do research. You only have to do it once per job for your resume. It's going to be on there uh, forever, helping you get interviews and, and benefiting you. So it might be a little bit uncomfortable to do, but you have to do it once and you're done. And it's, it's like an investment that's going to help you get better jobs, literally for, for life. So uh, please go out and do that. It's really going to help you. Uh, tweak number three. So you should replace your soft skills with hard skills. Um, and, and in just a second, I'll explain why soft skills are not the thing to be putting on your, on your resume. Um, so hard skills, these can be like areas of work, tools and technologies you've worked with. Here are some examples like Microsoft Excel, data engineering, Java programming, that's one specific programming language or technology, um, phone sales, that's like an area of work, retail customer service, packaging engineering, training employees, it could be any number that Microsoft Word, any number of things. Those are hard skills, specific skills that prove you'll be able to come in and do a job that, that uses these skills. Uh, don't just guess what to put. Look at the job description, and, and I mean, that's the best place to, to get ideas of what to put on your own resume. Grab two or three general job descriptions for the type of job you're applying for. So if you're applying for sales training manager positions, Grab like three job descriptions for sales training managers or sales training leads. Um, and look at the hard skills that they want. Do they, you know, training is probably one of them. Um, what, you know, what, else is, what, what else is there? Do they want somebody you can give presentations, like creating and delivering presentations? Well, then put that as one of your skills. But you really want hard skills like that. Here's why you don't want soft skills and why soft skills really, really do not get you the interview. Um, Essentially, as a recruiter or as a hiring manager, when I look at your resume, and I mentioned this earlier, but I'm looking for proof that you can come in and succeed in this next job. I'm looking at like, are you capable of, of succeeding? Um, and so if your resume is full of buzzwords like hardworking, fast learner, highly motivated, really general things, go-getter, um, words like that, it doesn't do anything to prove you can succeed in this job. Um, those are, are things that suggest you have the right personality to fit in well on a team. Unfortunately, the hiring manager or myself or whoever's interviewing you, we're going to be assessing that in the interview. We're going to try to find out, do you work well as a team? You know, are you hardworking? Are you resilient? You know, do you stay tough when, when things are difficult? Do you still come into work with a good attitude and, and push through? And those are all super important and things that can get you the, the job in your interview. And if you don't show those things, it can cost you the job in your interview. But that all happens in the job interview. And we really don't look for it or don't care on your resume because none of that matters if you don't have the skills to actually just do the basic work. 
So on your resume, we're looking for real hard skills and evidence and proof and past accomplishments that, that demonstrate you can, at a core level, you can come in and do this work. You're capable of learning this job. And then we'll start to think about those other things. Um, so that's the general idea here. I kind of, I didn't even look at these bullets as I talked to you through this, so let's just go through this quickly here. Um, so those are some of the, you can see some of the buzzwords that you really don't need. Um, recruiters and employers are looking for proof, I mentioned this, that you can succeed in their job. The thing that we are thinking as we read your resume is does this person have the skills and experience needed to come in and succeed? It's really important to know. You've probably heard me repeat it a few times by now, but it's really, really essential to, to know and think about. Uh, and like I mentioned, employers wait until the interview to measure your soft skills and personality. It's one of the last things we care about on your resume, plain and simple. It's not going to get you the interview. Only exception, I would say, uh, is if you see a specific soft skill on the job description, you can add it as a keyword. Uh, it's good to, to show them that you have the traits that they specifically mention wanting. But otherwise, focus on hard skills. Do not flood your skills section or your intro paragraph or anything else on your resume with soft skills. Uh, an example of this exception may be you're reading the job description and they say, we're looking for a highly motivated sales professional who can thrive in a fast-paced environment. And then maybe somewhere in your most recent job or in your intro paragraph, you can say highly motivated sales leader who, who does his best work in a fast-paced environment, uh, responsible for blank and blank last year. And so you can find a way to include it. That was an example off the top of my head. You could probably do better if you sat down with a, a pen and paper or sat down with your laptop for 20 minutes, but you can include it if you see it on the job description. Otherwise, forget it. Final step, after you do these three tweaks, you really want to tailor your resume for the job. Um, recruiters and hiring managers read your resume and compare it to the job description. We're not reading your resume thinking, ooh, you know, is this impressive in general or does this person, like I mentioned, we're not thinking, does this person seem hardworking? No, we're thinking, have they done work in the past or do they have training or education or skills that will let them come into this next job that they've just applied for and get up to speed quickly, learn the role, succeed and thrive here. That's really what we're thinking about. So because we're reading your resume, with the job description in mind, you should really be writing it with the job description in mind. Look at the job posting. You know, spend half your time writing your resume, but half your time looking at job postings for the positions you want. And then when you're ready to apply for a specific job, really sit down with, with that, that job description and your resume side by side. And it's one of the best way to get one of the best ways to get more interviews. In terms of actual steps you'll take when tailoring, I'm going to cover this in a future video coming up very, very soon, um, but you can add content based on what you see on the job description. So you see a keyword or skill that, that you have but you forgot to mention on the job description, put it on your resume. And then also you can reorder your content and your bullets, and I highly recommend this. So if you have, let's say you have six bullet points for your most recent job on your, uh, on your resume, and you might have a lot of the things the employer wants, but just check the job description and see what order they mention things. If they've put the requirements in terms of bullets or sometimes if they write a paragraph, however it's presented, look at the order they're doing it. And the first like one or two things they mention should be your first one or two bullets. So I've helped some people where they're going for a leadership position and they did lead people in their past job, um, but maybe it was like the sixth bullet down. So they have five other bullet points under their recent work and then they have leading and training and onboarding and giving seminars to new hires and all that training stuff is lower down. Well, part of tailoring is they want to reorder that content and move it up to the top of, of those bullets. So like the first and second bullet under their, their last role would now be about training and leadership. And that way, when the hiring manager for this, this leadership job that they've applied for, look, applied for, uh, when they look, they're going to see that immediately. They're going to say, okay, this person has led and trained people in the past. That's perfect. And then your third and fourth bullet point can be the third and fourth thing mentioned on the job description and so forth. So those are the two main things you can do when tailoring. We'll talk more about this, but for now, know that you can add content based on what you've seen on the job description, but just as important is reordering your content so that the recruiter or hiring manager sees right away in that first 10 second glance that, that you have the, uh, the main things they're looking for in the job.